What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nuclear Barbarians. It is I, your nuclear barbarian, and I am here with my favorite ONG pirate from Digital Wildcatters, Colin McClell McClelland. How you doing, buddy? Dude, I am doing good, and I'm excited about this conversation. You know, we were just talking on the mic for a couple minutes before we hit record, and I was like, dude, you have to start recording this. We're already yeah. recording the podcast. <laughs> we're having some fire conversation here. Yeah, so, no, for I'm, real. I'm, I'm excited that we're getting to link up, man. We've been friends on Twitter for a while, and this is our first time getting to talk. So um, I appreciate you uh, giving me a platform to talk about uh, energy and appreciate all the work that you're doing as well. Hey, likewise, man. Um, I'm really excited for all that educational content that's coming out of Digital Wildcatters. We're going to talk about that because like, as somebody who's a complete layman that just stumbled into this stuff, like what you're doing is super valuable to me, uh, who's become like an, somehow an energy communicator for a living. Um, yeah. And I think it's, it's good for uh, the American citizenry overall. But before we get into that, dude, tell me about you. You come out of ONG, but that's always yeah. an interesting story. Yeah, so I grew up in West Texas in the middle of the Permian Basin, the most prolific oil and gas basin um, in the United States and arguably, you know, one of the top ones in the world. And so I uh, graduated high school in 2008 from Midland Lee. If you've ever watched Friday Night Lights, uh, you may be familiar with Midland Hell Lee. Hell yeah, dude. And uh, went straight to drilling oil wells out of high school. And instead of going to college, I wanted to learn the oil and gas business from the ground up. And so mm. this was like right before American Shell. I mean, we're still drilling. Uh, conventional vertical oil and gas wells, and then got to see firsthand boots on the ground, the rise of American shale and start drilling these long horizontal wells and being part of really changing, um, changing the world in terms of energy production and um, really kind of throwing a wrench in, in the plans of OPEC. And so I was always super proud to be out there and, uh, <laughs> and doing that just because, you know, I like being a pain in everyone's ass and disrupting things. And so it felt like uh, a pretty cool thing to be a part of. And um, kind of worked up my ranks of the oil and gas industry and um, got to see some really cool things. You know, I took a job as a project manager and got to manage drilling and completions projects um, on the north slope of Alaska, you know, in negative 60 degree Fahrenheit weather. I spent time on deep water drill ships in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I've even worked on wells in the middle of golf courses in Los Angeles. And so I've got to see wow. um, kind of boots on the ground operations all over the United States for oil and gas. And then and, um, you know, in 2018, started seeing some changes in the industry. And one of them was uh, the great crew change. You know, you had no Gen Xers in the energy industry. It was all boomers. Gen X wasn't here because of the uh, crash in the 80s. They just didn't go to school for petroleum engineering or geology or any other technical professions. And so boomers ran the industry. And then all of a sudden you had millennials coming up with the, uh, the shell revolution. And that opened up the opportunities for several different things. One was digital technology in the industry. The industry was always, you know, 10 to 15 years behind on software. Mm. And you started having the rise of cloud computing and SaaS based solutions. So you started having these cool technologies being built. Um, no one was creating content in the industry, which was just kind of wild to me. It's one of the largest industries in the world and no one was creating content, you know, on podcasts and memes and social yeah, media yeah, yeah. content. And so all of these things started happening where I was like, holy shit, I'm quitting my job and I'm going to go, I'm going to go start creating content. And, um, you know, fast forward to today, we've, uh, successfully built a company called Digital Wildcatters, which is a very community-centric media company. And we have uh, different podcasts, we have uh, different industry conferences and live events and technology to serve um, professionals in the energy industry. And so I think that, um, you know, the energy industry is probably the most exciting industry to work in um, today. I think that the energy crisis is the biggest problem that society currently faces. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, coming from a background in oil and gas, which is a very hated industry um, among general society now. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, also being very um, uh, forward thinking has led us to have a belief in pro energy. And, you know, I think nuclear plays a big part in that. And so um, that was one reason I was excited to link up with you and link up with someone that's kind of telling the story of nuclear, because I think that um, when you look at the world needs, it's a combination of um, a, a diverse and reliable energy mix. And so that's what we're trying to do today is uh, be able to tell those stories and educate society on energy. Yeah, dude, I love all that. Um, I think people don't realize how many rigs there are in LA. 
like having lived there, you know, like that's something that like, to, first yeah. of all, they cover a lot of them in like shelters. And the only reason I know about it is because the Center for Land Use Interpretation out there next to uh, the Museum of Jurassic Technology used to run a bus tour to every single rig in LA. <laughs> really? So yeah. it's so funny because uh, two weeks before I went to work on that well, my uh, my stepmom's family was here in town and they live in LA. And I was like, oh, I'm going to LA in a couple of weeks to work on this well. And they're like, really, where at? I was like, uh, it's uh, right here in Brea. And they're like, we live in Brea. We had no idea that there's oil field there. You know, Brea is literally uh, Spanish for tar. And yeah. you go to Brea yeah. and, you know, my hotel has like old wildcatter, wooden derrick paintings. And it's yeah, very yeah, much yeah. A, a historic oil town. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm driving around in a major intersection there's a pump jack right at the corner of it in the in in this parking lot of this uh of this uh golf club and it's just like you know people drive by these things all the time and just never question like hey what is that thing that's going up and down there and when you go to my home you know my home west texas everyone knows what a pump jack is and so oh, yeah for um, sure it, it's pretty funny and you know you go to huntington beach and you have deep water uh drilling rigs mm -hmm. right there off the beach because they have a really shallow shelf and so you're just chilling on the beach and there's uh personnel helicopters flying back and forth and so i find that to be extremely interesting but it's uh, also it, it really illustrates the lack of energy iq among society where mm -hmm. people out in la live among it and they honestly don't even know that it's there no totally so <clears throat> I love that you're from Midland, by the way. I don't know, like, so I've told this story a few times. I tell it to like every single ONG dude I meet is like, I was, I was a nuclear guy and um, I knew a little bit about that, a little bit about the grid, a little bit about renewables, right? Like that, but I'd come into energy through nuclear and my dad used to live in Alpine. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so I flew out from LA. My wife and I flew out and you have to land in Midland and then drive out. Yeah. There, right. <laughs> and I remember landing and walking into the airport and seeing nothing but like technical advertisements for machinery. And I was like, this is awesome. I was like, this bangs. And then we're like driving through and my dad's like pretty bleak, right? I'm just seeing like huge trucks and like Mexican American three percenter dudes like at the yeah. Texas gas station. And I'm like, Dude. this goes off. I was like, this is what I'm talking about. I was like, Dude. this is going to be here forever. <laughs> It's, you know, a lot of people will talk shit about Midland and Odessa because it's a very ugly place from a geographical perspective. I mean, it's yes. just flatland desert, no trees, no water. It's just dirt and mesquite. But it's also one of the most unique places in the world for all of those things that you just <laughs> mentioned. I mean, nowhere else can... You walk into an airport and it's just advertising for oil field services and frack fleets and things of this nature. And you get outside of the airport and, you know, every three and four uh, automobiles is a uh, pickup. It's a white mm -hmm. pickup truck. And it's just very industrial. And, um, you know, to be honest, it's just a uh, place that's really just no bullshit, um, rewards hard work and um, is full of a, a lot of opportunity. And so really random that your dad lived in Alpine, um, you know. <laughs> Midland's out in the middle of nowhere, but Alpine's really in the middle of nowhere. Oh yeah, so, oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, here's see, here's I bring this up because a few years before I did that, I was out in Marfa because I used to live in New Mexico, oh, okay. uh, protesting a pipeline, the Trans Pecos, as it was finally being completed. Right, so I was on the complete yeah. other side of this, right, and now I'm on the complete opposite side. So I know wow. what my story is and how I became energy educated and what happens there. I think we wanted to be in touch with each other for a while. And then we finally made it happen when I reached out to you, when you showed clips from a very funny, very true slide deck you did on telling better energy stories. And I don't think I could replicate what happened to me for anybody else, but I feel like a version of it could happen for other people, either for nuclear and or oil and gas. So yeah, dude, how does, how you said it, this is, it's now a nationally hated industry. How do you rehab this industry? Well, how do we tell better energy stories that aren't the climate change story? Because that's what I'm interested in. Yeah, you know, one, I could flip this podcast on you pretty easy and start diving into your story. And so uh, <laughs> I, I want to hijack the hijack the show, but maybe I'll have to have you on my podcast sometime soon. But you know, that that 
pitch deck that you were referring to, I was giving a talk at a uh, frac sand conference and, you know, out of all things frac sand. And at the, <laughs> at the beginning of that, uh, at the beginning of that presentation, I said, hey, look, the oil and gas industry has clearly lost the narrative. And so the reason mm -hmm. that we lose the narrative is because uh, we're an industry full of nerds. We have a bunch of geologists and engineers and just very uh, scientific and engineering driven people. It's the most technical workforce in the world. And you know, I told the crowd, I was like, look, you may be looking at me like, Colin, we're not a bunch of nerds. I'm like, dude, you're sitting at a frag sand conference. Chill. You're, you're a nerd. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with being hey. a nerd, but the <laughs> yeah, no, no, we need them. We need them. Oh, we need nerds. And I consider myself a nerd. And, but the problem is, is that this industry likes to talk with data and facts and society doesn't care about data and facts. Mm -hmm. They care about emotional driven narratives and storytelling. And that's what wins people's hearts and minds. And so I think one thing that um, the oil and gas industry does very poorly, and I also think that the nuclear industry uh, is very poor in this too, mm -hmm. is actually um, being a good storyteller and bringing a human element to the industry. You know, I was a few months ago, I was up in New York City. I got invited to this um, this uh, private two day event with a couple of high level media entrepreneurs, people I all really respected what they're building. And none of them could believe that we had been building this media company in oil and gas. Like oil and gas is so mm -hmm. foreign to them, they just had no clue. But I spent two days with these people and they were infatuated and so curious, not just about digital wildcatters, but about the energy industry mm -hmm. as a whole, because to them, you know, living in New York city, growing up in New York city, it's just never, it's never crossed their mind that, Oh, Hey, electricity doesn't just come out of my wall when I plug <laughs> yeah, something into sure. it. Yeah. There's this incredibly complex industry with trillions of dollars capex spent per year. And they're just completely oblivious to it. And so that's why they're curious. They're like, how can I, I've been living life and there's something happening that I'm just completely not exposed mm -hmm. to. And so from my experience and having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people is that most times people are very curious to learn about energy production. They just haven't had a medium or an interesting way to go about learning about the industry. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is um, an actual very easy problem to solve um, in today's day and age. As you know, you know, you've started up this podcast. There's the ability to get content up and running. You don't have to go create some huge TV show on cable news network mm -hmm. or, you know, um, you know, start up a channel. It's literally, hey, uh, we have a ton of hardworking people in this industry that do really cool things on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's arm them to be able to go tell the stories. And, you know, in that deck that you mentioned, I, I, I had this conversation with Precision Drilling, um, or our company had this conversation with Precision Drilling and said, hey, y'all do some very cool work. Y'all should be on TikTok having your hands out on these drilling rigs, showing what they're working mm -hmm. on. And they've done that. And since then, they've blown up over the last few months. You know, I have 10,000 followers and um, are able to, you know, show firsthand what it takes to produce energy for the world. And I think that's really needed because, um, you know, when you look at the narratives that are driven by mainstream media and by the White House and mm -hmm. other organizations, um, it's it's just very um, inaccurate and non-factual information mm -hmm. that's thrown out there. And so people aren't armed with the right information to make decisions um, for themselves on, on where they stand. And so even just taking, you know, taking climate out of it, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a lot of misinformation about, um, you know, the, the viability of renewables to power a hundred percent of electricity. Yeah. Like, you know, we've thrown an event called fuse, which is the South by Southwest of energy tech. And I brought everyone together. I brought in, you know, Toby Rice from, he's the mm. CEO of EQT, the largest nat gas producer in the United States. And I had him right next to Mike Skelly, who's one of the OGs in wind development. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like Mike Skelly got up there and it's like, hey, I'm just going to tell you if you think that renewables are going to provide 100% of electricity, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you don't know what you you're got another thing about, coming. So. Yeah. 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 And so um, it's about getting that message out. And really for me, being pro energy, saying, hey, look, at the end of the day, um, 
energy is upstream of everything. It is the most critical thing mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. earth. And it's really at the core of this universe is energy. And so being able to have um, affordable and reliable energy to everyone around the world is um, an extremely um, critical mission. And you need all of the above when it comes to energy um, right now. And that includes oil and gas, nuclear, coal, wind, solar, geothermal, and um, really think about it pragmatically like that. No, absolutely. I love that. I love the idea of, of uh, humanizing the profession like that is something that you've talked about. I think that's gone really well for nuclear with people like um, Heather Hoff over at uh, Diablo Canyon and her mothers for nuclear thing. I think that's really flipped um, a lot of people, but there's also this other element that I was thinking about. You might like this. I was rewatching the, the bones brigade documentary. You okay. Know, uh, Tony yeah. Hawk's old skate team. Right. And, yeah. uh, um, and you know, the thing that like, we never talk about is that skating used to be lame. Like you were a loser if you skated, like it was not yeah. this like symbol for coolness or whatever that it is now. Yeah. <laughs> it was super lame. Like a lot of things in the seventies, it totally died after getting popular because no one knew how to build parks. So they ripped out all the infrastructure nation wide and it almost died. And then I was like, how did they come back from this? Like, yeah. how did this happen? Okay. So first of all, you have incredible skaters. Right. Like, so you have stuff that works. Tony, Nuclear. Tony, Hawk pro, Tony Hawk pro skater probably did a ton to bring, yeah. bring skating back. Right. It did that. But how did it do it in the eighties and nineties? And a lot of it was this dude, Craig Stesic, who took all the iconic photos of the Z boys and who did the advertising for Powell Peralta skateboards, which sponsored bones brigade. And he was like, right. he was like, we don't need to do technical ads that showcase the mechanics of the board. Like everybody else. He was like, you know, the skateboard magazines by taking photos of our guys will do that for us. We need to deal in concepts and images. Yeah. And so he's like non-literal, cool, funny, strange, get eyeballs and like earned media on it. And I'm like, damn, yes. I think that's also what we need because we need to bring people's hearts into it. And then we need to bring their eyes into it. Right. Yeah. You know, that's um, a super interesting analogy that you brought up there. You know, you look at skateboarding, not only was it not cool for a period of time, it was also really kind of criminal. You know, you'd go, yeah. <laughs> remember like, uh, what was the, what was the saying in the 90s? Skateboarding, like, skateboarding is not a crime. Yeah, skateboarding is not a crime. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, really weird evolution. And now it's funny because you watch videos of Tony Hawk and, you know, he'll drive around and be like, do a kickflip. And his mind is blown that you can just go around and tell kids to do a kickflip and they can just land it back then. Like a kickflip was a big deal. And, um, you know, the, the storytelling aspect of that, you look at any good marketer because really at the end of the day, I just consider myself to be a storyteller and I just happen mm -hmm. to grow up in the oil field. But, um, so I always look at other good storytellers. And if you look at it from like a brand perspective, like Nike, for example, mm -hmm. Nike never talks about the technical, uh, capabilities or features of their shoes. They make you believe that you can be Michael Jordan, that you can be Serena mm -hmm. Williams. You look at Apple, you know, I, one of the best advertisements ever, I think was the iPad, uh, uh, I think it was the nano or the shuffle mm -hmm. and it didn't give you any technical uh, uh, specifications. All it said was a thousand songs in your pocket and yeah. you're just like, damn. And so storytelling and not getting lost in the sauce of uh, technical things, you know, it was just uh, uh, one of my really good friends, Mark Myers, he hosts a podcast with me and one of the smartest guys I know in mm -hmm. the oil and gas industry uh, ran a uh, research firm for an investment bank. He was CTO of a big oil and gas company. And um, we we're talking about the, he, he corrected. Oh, he said, there's no such thing as an oil rig. And I was like, I call everything an oil rig. I said, because that's easy to communicate with everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, so here's your problem, Mark. I said, you're just like every other engineer in this industry and you get lost on the technicalities. You guys would rather, argue about how to spell fracking. Does it have a K? Does it not have a K? Right, just getting yeah. the, the point across. And so anyways, um, you know, I think that, um, I think that that's one thing with this industry. And I honestly don't think that it's always been like this. Um, because if you look at, um, um, you remember, I mean, you're not, you're not old enough and neither am I, but I just know about the show Cosmos from, uh, I believe it was the seventies mm -hmm. and how mm -hmm. many, uh, physicists today were inspired by that show Cosmos. 
Cosmos was funded by the oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. And they were like super excited to create content that was going to go teach the world about science. And the industry just got away from doing that. And I think the reason, I don't think I know the reason is, is because the industry never had to create content and market. You produce a commodity that's needed by the world. Why the hell do you need to market and tell your story? They're going to it regardless. And that has clearly changed now to where, yes. hey, we do need to be storytellers. We do need to create content. And that's the world that we live in now. And I think that I see some incredible things that happen in the oil and gas industry, especially today with what's happening in uh, methane mitigation and flaring. Mm -hmm. Just talking to a friend who's um, he's uh, an engineer at Endeavor. Endeavor is one of the largest independent oil and gas producers in the world, uh, ran by Autry Stevens, just an old school, you know, hard nose wildcatter and very uh, just conventional kind of operation. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me what they're doing and using uh, uh, methane detection technology, both on uh, fixed wing planes and uh, drones, and mm -hmm. then how they dial that in to find exactly where the uh, methane emission is. And then it goes into this whole work order within 48 hours. They have a technician. Oh, dude, out there that's, that's huge. Technician. I'm like, dude, that's go huge. fucking tell these stories, man. Dude. I'm like, and that's like an old school oil and gas operator that's yeah. doing some very complex operations uh, to mitigate methane leaks. And so, um, and they just don't tell that story. <laughs> no, I mean, so that to me, like that's, that's huge, right? Because I think like, first of all, the in industry gets uh, beaten with the methane emissions thing over and over again. I know like I've done it, frankly, like um, yeah. until, until I started to learn more this year about uh, methane mitigation and what's going on there. And then- <clears throat> The reason why I just want to say this real quick, because I think that that's such an incredible story, is that it's like, if you have a ton of pipeline, think about how many like adjacent property owners you're going to have to deal with if you're just going like foot by foot through that pipe. If you can simplify that process to dealing with one or two property owners, yeah. like, first of all, no paperwork, no legal stuff, and then get the work order in in 48 hours that is wild. And I love yeah. that you brought up, like, how do you spell fracking? Like, is it an oil rig? <laughs> Whatever. I just had Jesse Freeston on, who is a uh, very lefty dude that used to be all like renewable economy and then got nuke pilled. And he did this great video about Ontario's switch from coal to nuclear, right? One of the cool. most canonical decarbonization things ever because they retrained the coal guys to be their nuclear guys, which yeah. is great, you know? Yeah. Um, and he used the industry term spent fuel, the whole video, right? And so he showed it to his anti-nuclear friends and they go, God, I wish you'd really talked about the waste. And that's what spent fuel means, but yeah. they don't know that, you know? <laughs> so he had to do a whole nother video where he was like, this is what the reality of the waste is. But like, that's what gets lost in this like, coming from highly technical industries where specification is super important because it means whether you're wrong or not, and that has material consequences to the softer world of images and ideas. Where that's really, so that's, so you're, what you're getting to is actually something that's um, non-trivial and important because mm. you have very smart people that are engineers and they don't want to use a term that isn't used in the industry for the fear of looking stupid for a better word um, amongst their peers. Um, but the reality is, is that you have to break these things down into simpler terms for general society to keep up with. And I'm not saying that most people in society are stupid, but they're just not, um, they're busy, you know? Yeah. They're not going to make that connection that, Hey, oh, spent fuel is, is waste. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a good example of this is, um, some people on my team, they don't come from the energy industry. And so I, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time um, educating them. And we went to this event and they had a wireline truck. And a wireline truck is an operation that's used in oil and gas. It was invented by the Schlumberger brothers, you know, like 120 mm -hmm. years ago, like incredible technology. And so they have this wireline truck and they go and ask the guys that are there at the booth, like, oh, hey, what is wireline? Can you explain it to us? And they walked up to me after that. And they're like, Hey, can you explain wireline to us? Cause I used, I used to be, a, I used to be a wireline hand and I'm not even shitting you in like 45 seconds, a minute, I um, told them what wireline was. And they're like, that was so much clearer and concise than what those guys over there told us. And I said, well, yeah, they're used to telling, you know, technical Other professionals. people that have a baseline understanding of 
oil and gas operations, they're not used to telling some, you know, just every everyday person. And so um, that's really what is, um, you know, that, that that's where the gap is. And it doesn't surprise me that, uh, you know, your friend had that that problem between uh, well, it, oil and waste. And not only that, it's this thing where it's like, um, you know, I love engineers. I learn from engineers like every single day. Yeah. You know, I have like huge respect for that profession and I rely on that profession so yeah. that I can be correct in my communication, right? Yeah. So this isn't a diss, but it's something that I've noticed is that there's a conflation. Uh, <laughs> oftentimes they think being right is the same thing as being effective. So you yeah. say, well, we don't want to call it nuclear waste because that makes people anxious. And it's technically more correct to say spent fuel. So we'll just keep saying that. And like that by making having the more technically correct term that's also not as threatening, we will be right. Yeah, you and know, we will be effective. And it's like, that's not how that goes, you know? And like you said, well, you can't rely on the fact that you're a necessary a a commodity anymore. If anybody in these industries thinks that because you are necessary, you will be treated as necessary, mm -hmm. buddy. The, <laughs> um, you know, going back to the, the fracking thing, the, the whole thing, um, there is, if you look at, you know, there's plenty of documentaries on Netflix that are anti-fracking and they always spell fracking with a K. It's F-R-A-C-K-I-N-G. Mm -hmm. Well, in the industry, we don't spell it with a K. It's spelled yeah, phrasing. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it'd be phrasing. Yeah, which... Let me, let me get, I'm going to, I'm going to get, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, when you just spell frack, yeah, it's cool. F R A C. Mm -hmm. But then when you're spelling fracking, they either put an apostrophe. So it's F R A C yeah. apostrophe I N G. Um, that's, that's how most people would typically spell it. And um, so a couple of things, one, my beef is that you can't just change the rules of the Eng English language to make up your own words. So it really likes the phrasing. And so I do think that if you're adding an ING, you put a K, but also that's besides the point is hey, general society uses fracking. And so I'm going to use that so that I can communicate with them instead of wasting my fucking time here thinking about, <laughs> like, oh, you know, people in the industry are going to, you know, come bust me over spelling it wrong. But I'm, I'm trying to communicate with people outside the industry and that allows them to connect with what I'm talking about because they've seen it before. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. So, Meeting people where they're at is a huge part of this, right? Like that's yeah. the, I think that's the beauty of what you're saying. We're talking about breaking things down because I think like once people see see this stuff once it's broken down to them they'll get it's first of all it's empowering when you learn about something essential it makes you feel like you have greater command over the world that might not be literally true but it makes you feel i think less vulnerable because you've done away with ignorance you didn't even know you had and then yes. the other part of it is like it makes it less scary and exciting because it's cool when you watch footage of dudes on rigs you're like damn i was like i was like thank god no one showed this to me when I was 18 because I would have immediately pissed my parents off. Like that's... Yeah, no, 100. <laughs> you know that's uh, it's so funny. I have a a great friend. His name's Nick Gray, and he had a birthday party in Austin, and all of his friends there were, were New York or LA transplants. And mm -hmm. when he introduced me, he's like, "Colin used to roughneck. He's like on rigs, like throwing steel around, and all these people's like jaws are dropped because they're like, oh my god, like that's so cool.' And it is cool." And if you ever have any time, go over to my TikTok and I have mm -hmm. videos that have done a million plus views. And all I'm doing is, uh, you know, recapping videos that I see of people working on rigs and you go in the comments and you'll have comments from, you know, kids that grew up in the Northeast and they're like, Hey, how can I get in the oil field? Yeah. I want to work hard. I think I could do this. And so that's huge for me because I always have this, um, I've always had this sense of guilt that um, I had opportunity that a lot of people don't because I grew up in the oil field and I saw mm. it and I was mm -hmm. able to reach out and get it. Um, also balancing that with, hey, it's 120 hours of hard ass work every week. So most people wouldn't do it even if they had the chance, but opening up opportunities for kids um, to understand like, oh, hey, I can go learn a trade and I can work hard and I can learn a skill and I can actually contribute to something that's very meaningful and impactful to society is huge and then what's funny talking about like not caring what some of the technical professionals think if you ever go what, one thing i love about the oil and gas industry is it's a huge uh uh for lack of a better term uh piss uh competition because <laughs> yeah, yeah. everyone's like um you know i'll make a video and i'll i'll, I'll say something just 
little bit off, you know, it's not wrong, but it wasn't, you know, maybe a hundred percent right in the terms of some oil and gas people. And they'll come in, they'll let me know. They'll comment and like, Oh, you worm, you're stupid. <laughs> you, you said backup tongs. It's actually lead tongs. And which is great for engagement on TikTok because the algorithm just starts pushing the video. Sure, so sure, yeah. I'll be, I'll be the punching bag all day. All I care yeah. about is having an impact for people that, you know, aren't going to know the differences between those things. So no, um, <laughs> dude, no, totally. I think that's, um, yeah, I've experienced the same thing. I've gotten like a couple things wrong, or I didn't emphasize a certain thing enough in an article, you know, and it's just like, yeah, what the other reactor at three mile Island kept running. And I'm like, okay, okay. That's not what the piece was about, but I get yeah, it. Um, you know, um, let me, let me bring up this story real quick, because I think that you'll find this interesting. You know, there was a plan to bring nuclear waste to West Texas mm -hmm. and there is a huge pushback from um, locals in West Texas, like, Hey, you're not going to come dump this nuclear waste out in West Texas. And I had people reaching out to me like, Hey, we need your help, uh, promoting this. And I was like, well, I don't necessarily agree with y'all's position. I was like, I don't think it's that big of a deal to inject yeah. nuclear waste out in the desert. Um, I was like, I just don't. Safest and, um, waste there is. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, and honestly, that was before I even knew a lot about nuclear waste. Mm -hmm. And, I saw a visual one time that showed a 55 gallon drum and in a 55 gallon drum, how much, uh, uh, mass, uh, was actually made up of nuclear waste. And then the rest, you know, you had concrete and other materials. Yeah. And I mean, it's really minimal. And, you know, I know there was a company, I don't know if they're still doing this, but they were looking at using, um, we did reservoirs in oil and gas wells to inject, mm -hmm. uh, nuclear waste. Sounds like that's a perfect, uh, perfect use case uh for that and so even in oil and gas areas like that you've had pushback to to nuclear waste because it's this big scary uh, mm -hmm. thing and uh, people just aren't familiar with it and so um you know if they have a way to be familiar with it and armed with information like you said then yeah that's that's how you get pragmatic decisions being made because people at least have some amount of base knowledge that they can operate off of no for sure so yeah their uh whole tech just had a storage facility approved for i think uh, somewhere near carlsbad you know like uh in new mexico and yeah. the governor was like i don't want it to seep into the ground and i could sense the press guy from whole tech's frustration when he was like it's a solid yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like i was like the fact like, that he said that to the press is like okay this guy's exasperated but like yeah. it's important for people to know that you know so now that you this is the perfect segue we talked off mic you were just like mm -hmm. you wanted to talk about what ong people think of nuclear let's get into it um yeah i've talked to some people from the industry and i know plenty of guys uh mutual friend of ours mark heineman super yeah bullish on nuclear. Doug Sandridge, yeah. friend of the show, uh, also big on nuclear. Um, there's, tell me there's about two, that. There's two responses that you'll get from people in oil and gas when it comes to nuclear. The first one is, yeah, of course, nuclear is the future. I mean, this industry understands energy density and physics. And so, <laughs> of course, yeah. nuclear is the future. The second response is, Shh, don't tell anyone that. It's the only thing that can displace <laughs> the only thing that can displace oil and gas but they still know they still know the truth right yeah and so um you know i find that super um interesting and you know there's this whole thing on twitter man where there's a lot of tinfoil hat conspiracy theory um pushers over on <laughs> twitter that think that oil and gas um plays a bigger role than what it actually does to suppress nuclear and renewables. And one thing I really want to highlight is that I don't know if there is another industry or type of people that is more capitalistic than the oil and gas industry. If they can make money in renewables or any other energy mm -hmm, uh, source, mm -hmm they'll underwrite it and they'll cut a check to do it. There's not some yeah, protected, yeah, yeah. you know, they're not trying to protect a um, asset. And I think that not to get off on a tangent here, but the biggest thing is, is, um, you know, this uh, recent push to ban natural gas stoves and, and homes um, and re 
classify what natural gas is called and call it, you know, fossil, uh, fossil methane or whatever mm -hmm. they want to call it. And they're like, this is, you know, calling it natural gas is this marketing campaign that the oil and gas industry has used to make it seem clean. I'm like, actually, no, it was developed over a hundred years ago to differentiate between synthetic gas. You had synthetic gas and you mm -hmm. had natural gas. I was like, mm -hmm. you were giving the oil and gas industry way too much credit if you think that they one know how to market or brand and story tell <laughs> uh, if, if some old dudes back in the 20s and 30s were like hey we need to call this natural gas because no one gave a shit back then so they weren't no. thinking about how we thought about it in 2000 you know uh 23 and so anyways um you know i think that uh i think that at the end of the day um and especially uh, i don't think a lot of people just understand the dynamics of oil and gas companies in the United States and in Canada. So, you know, broader North America, they always think that it's just big, bad Exxon or BP or Chevron, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. you have thousands of uh, oil and gas producers um, in the, in the United States. And um, I think a lot of them understand that there are different parts of the energy mix and they play a critical part in it. And I think they just want to, you know, I think they're just tired of being bastardized and demonized. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even Elon Musk, when he's on Joe Rogan's podcast a couple of years ago, it's like, hey, people in oil and gas, they've done really important work for yeah. the world. And all of a sudden, overnight, they're being demonized. He's like, how do you think that makes them feel? And so I think that that's, you know, a really important element. But, you know, when it comes yeah. to nuclear most people in oil and gas understand energy density and, and yeah, uh, well, the, your energy guys, you get it, you know, like that's the, that's the thing. I'm really glad you brought up sort of the, the, how it feels to be demonized. This is something that I think is, um, I think it can be a touchy thing to bring up with anybody and in, because in, you're, it's almost like you're talking about scar tissue. It doesn't feel yeah. good. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that's the, and, and it's really hard to figure out how to transcend resentment also because social media really encourages that emotion in all of us like yeah. about everything not just certain things yeah. that might really matter like what we do with our energy so let me ask you this like how the industry from my i'm outside the industry as somebody who's observing i'm seeing guys like you i'm seeing other people pop up it seems like they are now responding to a need for there to be better stories and stuff like that um and also to like stand up for themselves a little bit more. Uh, how do you see that starting to change right now? And also how are, have people been feeling and how is that starting to change for them and the industry? Yeah, you know, um, I think that Digital Wildcatters has been a catalyst for change in the mm -hmm. industry. You know, back in 2016, no one was putting out content in the industry back in 2018, when I really started going heavy in it, I remember people telling me that I was committing career suicide uh, mm. by creating content like this. And, um, you know, fortunately, I just don't give a shit what anyone thinks. And I just kept <laughs> making, <laughs> making content, but you are starting to see a change. And let's look at EQT and Toby Rice, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Toby is, has become a great friend of mine. And when I met Toby, you know, Toby told me something really cool. Um, my first viral video ever, I'm in Denver, I'm at Union Station and I'm walking around and I pull out my phone and I create this video talking about how these oil and gas companies need to adopt new technology. And mm -hmm. um, there was a tagline in there. I said, oil and gas companies need to evolve or die. Mm -hmm. And that's become Digital Wildcatter's tagline ever since. Mm -hmm. That's how people know us as Evolve or Die. And when I first met Toby, he's like, when you made that video saying Evolve or Die, he's like, that shouldn't inspire me, man. And that was extremely important to me. And I started getting to know Toby. And I said, Toby, you need to be, you know, you're the CEO of the largest natural gas producer in the world. You need to uh, be a face for the industry and telling your story. And we partnered up with them and uh, went and created this uh, documentary on YouTube and uh, met with Larry Kane. Larry Kane is a uh, third or fourth generation dairy farm in Southeast Ohio. I mean, just salt of the earth mm -hmm. guy, amazing guy. And he represented 2000 landowners 
when they sold their mineral rights to formerly Rice Energy, which got acquired by EQT. And we went out there and recorded this documentary with them and showed the prosperity that natural gas brought to that region. And you should go watch it. It's an extremely cool video because Larry Kane has fully automated his dairy farm where he wakes up in the morning. And I mean, I'm telling you, this guy, you shake his hand, like you can tell this dude has been working since working he was with a his boy. Hands. Yeah, He's yeah, working yeah. since he was a boy, back breaking work. And now he wakes up, he gets on his computer and he checks his analytics and his cows, they walk into this, uh, it looks like a NASCAR pit stop. It's got these lasers that come out, <laughs> measure its udders and suction cups come out. It goes out when it poops. Uh, they got these uh, huge Roombas that scoop up the manure, put Whoa. it out there automatically fed i mean it is a hundred percent automated and his next step was yeah now i'm looking at how i can uh capture rng from the manure and power of the farm an incredible story and you know we made this on youtube and um it did you know half a million views over on youtube and now if you actually go look at eqt's investor relations deck there's a slide in there that is our video on YouTube that we made and showing all the good work that um, natural gas has done for an area that really just didn't have a ton of economic development uh, prior to that. And so I think that you're starting to see massive change in the industry where people are getting comfortable um, with showing content, telling the story, you know, oil and gas used to be super tight to the chest. Hey, everything mm -hmm. that we do is proprietary and it's in a black box, which I honestly think that, that is one of the biggest things that's hurt the industry. I think one of the biggest things that hurt this industry was not disclosing which chemicals are used in frac fluids because yeah, they're, they're, sure. rel they're relatively harmful uh, chemicals that are used, um, things that you can oftentimes find at a hardware store or around your house, but disclosing those because of proprietary blends always had this black box of oil and gas is injecting who knows what into the sure, ground. Yeah, yeah. And so um, I think that they're starting to uh, get over that. And I, I want to give a shout out to another company that I, I'm just in love with. Their name's ST9 and they make these electric frack pumps. And so that's another very cool thing that's happening in the oil and gas industry right now is the electric is the electrification of um, operations. And you have these massive uh, operations around fracking and they're all converting to electric and some of them are even using uh, nat gas and nat gas turbines right there on lease to power Ooh, them. and uh, so it's just super super efficient microgrids and um, anyways I remember uh, uh, the CEO Chris Buckley telling me I made this TikTok and I mean the TikTok's done millions of views across TikTok, LinkedIn and Instagram and he's like yeah dude he's like fuck this black box shit that's in the oil and gas industry um he's like we're you know we're here to build better and build together and we want to mm -hmm. show people what we're doing and also apologize for dropping all the f-bombs on your podcast but, oh dude uh, no who cares? Uh, uh, this just, is this is my rodeo i, just, I, I do I, it all I, the I just assume if anyone invites me on their podcast, <laughs> they know yeah. that. Yeah. Bro, that's it's called Nuclear that. Barbarians, dog. Like, <laughs> yeah. People know what they're getting. <laughs> I, I figured that's the vibe. I just I, I realized uh, when we're 30 minutes into this that uh, so I figured I'd apologize. <laughs> no, don't even but, worry. Yeah, so, um, dude, I think, that, I think that the industry is changing in that. And then the other uh, cool thing that I see happening here, you know, in Houston, we'll have to get you down to Houston sometime, man. Um, oh, I'd love that. You I'd know, love that. Yeah. The, the thing that I saw, Digital Wildcatters is the only platform that's bridging the gap between traditional and new energy. And I had all of these one-on-one -on -one conversations. You know, I have friends in climate tech. I have friends in renewable. Obviously, you have friends in oil and gas. Um, and I was like, how can I have these very reasonable and sound conversations with everyone from different backgrounds or different parts of the industry and then I go over on Twitter and it's like, everyone's at each other's throat trying to kill each other, you know, it's a Simpsons monkey knife fight meme. hundred <laughs> percent. And it's usually people in renewables because they hate people in oil and gas and they hate nuclear. Yeah, and, so, true. and like, everyone's just going at each other's throat. And that's what I realized early on. I was like, I see this on a one-on-one -on -one basis that most of us aren't that far off. Um, mm -hmm. like we're pretty much kind of on the, on the same page with each other. And, um, that's when it became a really big mission for me to start bringing everyone together. And we've been able to do that through our content and our events. And so, um, I think that the, the culture of energy is changing, 
um, rapidly and exponentially. Yeah. I think so too. I think the, um, you know, like if I'm going to be completely honest, like the energy crisis, like, isn't over, like it might be over, but we don't know, you know, like if ONG continues to be underinvested in Europe and if they have a cold winter, um, it's going to be a very different story over there. They haven't replaced their flows from Russia with LNG. We're going to, we're, we're bailing them out basically is what's happening and good on us. That's awesome. Love that. Um, but there will be real material consequences for missteps in energy policy and energy economics. And I think as uh, people pull the trigger on wrongheaded policies, that is going to be a huge call to action for all of us in energy to bring yeah. better information, more confident information, and to not rely on fear to get the messaging across, because I think that will overcome the wave of anxiety that seems to overwhelm people, especially young people on this issue. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and I also think it's important to kind of define what the energy crisis is, because if we look, if we say energy crisis and we look on it on a very short, acute timeline here mm -hmm. over the last couple of years, you know, there have been real consequences. There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions, I don't know what the real number is of people that have died in Ukraine, in Russia. And that is purely a, a uh, you know, the, the reason that that war is happening is because you have a petrol warlord that has leverage over Europe's natural gas supply and mm -hmm. sustainability to, to continue living the life that they live. And mm -hmm. um, so these things become extremely important and, you know, I think that we ought, we like to talk about energy independence. I think that there is no such thing as energy independence. I think that the name of the game is creating a secure and diversified energy mix. Yeah. You know, energy even, security is real. Energy independence is fake. That's how I yes. think about it. Yeah. No, I I agree with that. And even if even if you threw physics and economics out the window and you said, hey. Um, we're going to run 100% off of wind and solar. Okay, well, we're pretty dependent on China now, um, right, both, from, yeah. <laughs> both from a material and a manufacturing standpoint. And so um, you know, I, I don't think that that's what we would necessarily um, want as Americans. Um, so I think that that all is really important um, um, to, to consider. And the other thing too is, you know, with nuclear, I just recorded a really great podcast with Brian Gitt, and I'm sure you've seen him on Oh, Twitter. I love Brian. I know him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's funny because Brian had reached out to me before he was even on Twitter for some advice on Twitter. Now he's bigger than me. Dude's just crushing it. <laughs> yeah, and, he crushes uh, it out there. Yeah. But amazing story. And now he's working with uh, SMRs and small modular reactors and nuclear and uh, just brought up something that hadn't even crossed my mind. He's like, yeah, I'm really trying to get these things in uh, uh, downstream oil and gas refineries for their heat. Oh, dude, and hell I was yeah. Like, oh. I was like, oh, shit. Like, I, how did I not even think about that? And yeah. so, you know, one thing, uh, you made a comment earlier about how you get to talk to a lot of smart engineers. And that's one thing that I've had the benefit of too, just doing what I do is I'm surrounded mm -hmm. by a lot of smart, people and i get to essentially have osmosis of information <laughs> and wisdom and i get to regurgitate that back out and um you know i think that it's really important um to to bring all those smart people together so that we can mm -hmm. figure out the energy crisis and we can work together and the the thing that i mentioned about the the timeline is if you zoom out just a little bit you know, I don't know what year you were born in. I was born in 89. And so I'm one missed, year before you. Yeah. Okay. So we missed uh, the oil embargoes and mm -hmm. things of that nature. And that was what, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? You know, another 50 years before that, um, we were decimating the whale population for, for whale oil. And mm -hmm. so if you look at modern society, one, we've only been industrialized for a couple hundred years and you run into other things like oil and gas is a finite resource. And so mm -hmm. um, even though it plays a critical role, these are finite resources, coal is a finite resource. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it's it's very much up for debate of how much uh, availability sure, yeah. we have of that resource, but it's like, okay, 
we should probably start figuring out new technological solutions before we run out of those resources. And, you know, there's a really, I'm not going to go down, man, if, if you want to take this offline, I can go down some like big uh, uh, conspiracy, I don't want to say they're conspiracy theories, uh, your background showing ancient Egypt. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually a lot of evidence that ancient civilizations, um, both in the Egyptians and Mayans, actually had access to advanced technology and, and potentially energy systems that we don't have mm -hmm. access to today. And so I spent a lot of my time thinking about that as like, okay, we um, we have all of these energy sources, whether it's uh, hydrocarbons, whether it's uh, mm -hmm. wind and solar or nuclear, but they're all very... Um, mechanical types of energy sources and you start thinking it's like okay if there's advanced civilizations out there and they are able to travel the cosmos do we think that mm -hmm. they're doing that with wind and solar are they doing that with nuclear if have they discovered <laughs> something some else yeah. way to harvest energy from the universe and so i think it's really important from a technological perspective like hey what we have today isn't necessarily the best thing that we should be using in the future while also accepting that it's very important that we use the things that we have yeah, sure, uh, today yeah. without, without collapsing society. And so anyways, I, uh, uh, I spend most of my days kind of, uh, thinking about the yeah, riffing on that. Of all, all those things. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, definitely. Definitely. Well, um, dude, this has been, Awesome. This is like exactly the conversation I wanted to have about this. Before I let you go, um, what's coming up for Digital Wildcatters? What should people look out for? Where can they find you? Yeah, so you can find us at digitalwildcatters.com. Um, if you want to find me anywhere on the internet, my handle is frackslap, no K. Um, <laughs> and so Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, um, on all those platforms. And, you know, the things to watch out for us um, – you know, we're about to go heavy on more uh, content, ed educational content um, for you. If you know anyone that can get me out on a nuclear uh, reactor facility, make sure. it happen because I'd love okay. to come out there and create uh, create some content. And then um, another big thing that we've been rolling out lately is our app, which is called Collide. And it's a place for energy professionals to um, have a dedicated space for energy conversations, find their next uh, job and uh, make deep network connections with other people in the energy industry. So uh, you can find that at collide.io. So we'd love to have you guys there. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Everybody that stuff will be in the show notes. Check it out. Colin. Thanks again. And everybody remember stay sharp, stay strong and stay radiant. We will see you next time.